squirting. Okay. Oh, my name is Aiden Swanson. This is a piece titled Girl, Capital G, a Workplace Drama. It's something that I've been working on and writing over the semester. Um, I want to continue to develop it after this class, um, maybe show more than just my friends and family someday. Um, but, yeah. Great, and I'm Professor Martin, and I developed a class uh, here at William Jewell College called Performers and Authors, and Aiden Swanson developed uh, an original devised piece in the class throughout the semester, and now we're having the final showcase this evening, and she will be performing the piece to a live audience and hopefully developing it in the future. So, I will give you the stage. Thanks. Nothing is more interesting to me in this life than human beings, people. The way they interact, think, believe, perceive. I'm a history major, see, and there's nothing more important to historical analysis than the individuals involved. Who were the people at any given moment? Why did they band together or revolt? Wars, kingdoms, empires, all these concepts studied in ancient history revolve entirely around the humans making it happen. I'm also a student of theater, and I think you can make the connection between my interests and studies there. Every time I read a play or act a scene or design a costume, I am becoming someone else, delving into human consciousness and interpreting that however I want. Really, we're all just actors in our own lives, and that's what I love about people, the way we give ourselves an identity and everyone around us, give ourselves a history and a future. Even the voices inside our own heads are just actors, our deprecation and self-awareness saturating our every thought. It's this relationship that I like to keep an eye on at all times. The roles we play and the roles everyone around us are playing and how those remain static or break over time. This phenomenon is most evident to me when I'm in a quasi-forced social situation. This could be school or a party, but I spend more time at work in a week than I spend sleeping, so it's this environment that I'll focus on, the workplace. I work in a buy-sell trade business called Vintage Stock. When I tell people I work at Vintage Stock, they usually think it's a thrift store, probably because Half my wardrobe was worn for the first time in the Salvation Army, and, and or worn for the first time in 1986 and purchased secondhand by me from the Salvation Army. Alas, it's more of a media trading post. Movies, music, video games, you name it. I applied for a job here for the first time the minute I turned 15. I didn't get a job here until three years later, the first semester of my freshman year of college. Incidentally, applying that time was less of a passionate attempt at nabbing my dream job and more of a vague excuse to escape the 10 by 10 concrete block prison cell that was my dorm room. It's been three years and despite interim breaks, I once tried my hand as a waitress at a Mexican restaurant. I learned the hard way that waiting tables is a terrible profession, or at least that I'm terrible at it. I never got tips. Why? I don't know. Maybe because I can't play the character type of flirtatiously busty waitress, or because I can't balance 18 trays in one hand, or because despite being able to memorize hundreds of lines from play scripts, I could never remember what the special of the day was. Whatever it is, I still find myself working away here in what has become a larger, more glorified prison cell. My version of 20 minutes of recreational activity in a prison yard is the moment I get to take the recycling out. I wonder what people on the outside must think of me, skipping down the sidewalk with cardboard boxes in hand, 
huge grin on my face, soaking in as much of the sun and false sense of freedom as I can before having to return to the inside. Since I started, I've worked with quite a few handfuls of people. That's the thing about jobs like these. Turnover is outrageous, and the cast is constantly shifting and adapting. So many employees came and went throughout the past couple of years. I'm not sure I could count on four hands. A few stayed no longer than a couple of months, like one of my favorites, Brian. Brian was a 35-year-old stay-at-home yo-yo enthusiast. And when I say stay at home, I mean with his parents. The guy had no ambitions except for those involving his yo-yo. He was probably one of the happiest people I'd ever worked with, which may have had something to do with the extra long pinky fingernail we all call this coke nail. He was probably a much more complex character than we gave him credit for. But he played his character so well, the quiet loser failing at adulthood, that we hardly noticed when he'd left. I remember turning to my boss one day and saying, where's Brian? And he goes, Brian's been gone for two months. Why do you think we hired Jessica? I shrugged and that was that. Brian was gone and in his place, we got a, a body double, almost literally. Jessica's androgynous body type and above average height allowed for the two to blend seamlessly. Though a different character archetype, the short timer Jessica would provide the necessary diversity to the cast until she'd be gone and we'd have to hire a new one. Speaking of Jessica, I think it's important here for me to mention the issue of gender in such a small employee pool. Since I started here, there have never been more than two girls working at my vintage stock at one time. At this point, I'm the only female of vintage stock, and though this can be hell when the guys act like misogynistic assholes or gang up on me or leave me out, I much prefer these types of trials and tribulations to that of trying to force an amicable relationship with someone trying to butt in on my role as girl. Capital G. One time, this got so bad, the guys began taking sides. It was Aiden versus Megan. Sarcastic, dry-humored, hip feminist versus the happy-go-lucky homeschooled girl next door. The battle of the brunettes. She walked in, and immediately, every guy in the store loved her. This would just not fly in the play that I created for myself. So, I took the route of essentially ignoring her existence. Ignorance is bliss, and anyone who tells you otherwise is a liar and a bad person. If Megan had taken my role as Girl Capital G, at least I didn't know it. There were times when I felt sort of guilty for ignoring Megan. Like, when she'd come into work with bleary post-cry face. If it was especially bad, I would come to her aid and give her advice, but for the most part, I wholeheartedly believed that the character she played was wretched, and that she would rather tell me why all the movies I like are terrible than carry on a worthwhile conversation with me. So, I remained oblivious, and Megan's plot line led her to dating the boss, which led her right out the door, at which time order was restored in my little world. In and out of our lives, she came and went, they all came and went, like nothing ever happened. There are employees that I don't even remember until reminded they came and went so quickly or quietly. It all makes me feel almost guilty. The other day, for example, this guy comes in, Zach, despite being fired for stealing comics, or as he might say, taking them home to see if he could afford them, Zach was a great guy, uh, extremely kind, super religious, he acted as sort of a basic element to combat everyone else's acidity. You know, the type to say, look on the bright side when we were all pissed off because some kid walked in and pooped on the floor. I'm not even kidding. That happened. A kid, probably 10 years old, which is way too old to be pooping on the floor, walked in and pooped on the floor. 
Her dad got her out of there so fast, we didn't even have time to make eye contact with him. Terrible people. Luckily, I dodged that cleanup duty. <laughs> anyway, Seth came in and we just, he didn't, oops. the guy walked in expecting us all to greet him with a, a bunch of attention, saying, hey, wow, how are you? I haven't seen you in so long. But what he got was me momentarily looking up from a transaction with a flick of the wrist and a pitiful hey and going back to my job, which is more than I can say for any of the other guys here who essentially ignored him. I always feel guilty when I observe this kind of disappointing reality check, so much so that I tend to be overzealous to try to make up for what reality lacks. It's difficult to find out that a place you spent so much time and expelled so much emotional energy at has moved on without you, and successfully so. You want to imagine that they think of you all the time. They're saying, man, I wish so-and-so was still here. Things just aren't the same without him. And maybe there are moments like these, but they pass. Uh, your position is taken and time ticks ever forward. You just can't revisit times gone by, expecting things to retain the magic that your memories have lent them. It's like going back to your childhood home and realizing how small it was, or going to your favorite park and realizing that the monkey bars were actually a rusty, dilapidated death trap. You'll be disappointed every time, and it is not worth tainting that chapter of your life, that scene. It doesn't need an afterword. It doesn't need a rewrite. It doesn't need a postscript or a coda. Leave it be. That's my advice. It's about to be me moving forward from here, arriving in a new setting, starting the next act. I will leave the set of vintage stuff behind, and each remaining character will move forward with his own play. I will be replaced. A new girl, capital G, will take my place and star in her own workplace drama. She might be just like me, or she might change girl, capital G, into a completely different character. Maybe she'll blend seamlessly, or maybe she'll shake things up for a brief moment. Either way, she'll be the new protagonist of vintage stock, just like I will be, of some new place in the city creating excitement and intrigue on some new stage. Because that's what we all do, whether we realize it or not. In order to cope, we make ourselves a part of something bigger, be it religion or a movie we're the star of or a, a book we're the main character of. Human nature is to plant ourselves within the framework of something, a worldview, small enough for us to comprehend, but that gives us larger than life significance. For me, it's all a play. And so far, all this, it's all been exposition.